Um, so I'm, I'm particularly thrilled about this next talk because I am a PhD student in the Department of Earth and Space Science, and I am uh, I'd be proud to introduce one of my colleagues. Um, Teresa Kazar is a PhD student uh, in the Department of Earth and Space Science in the College of the Environment. Teresa earned her bachelor's degree at the University of Arizona before coming to the UW to engage in isotope geochemical research, specifically developing uranium series isotope protocols here. She's completed a certificate in environmental management and can be counted among the UW's cohort of NSF graduate research fellows. Teresa has completed several field seasons in Kanchaka, Russia, uh, studying volcanic systems, as well as, an in, as well as internships with Chevron and the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where she'll be um, um, working this summer. So I'm extremely proud to welcome my colleague and friend Teresa to the stage to uh, talk to you a little bit about um, heavy metals and uh, what they can do in our environment. How do I get to the top? Is there a pointer? <laughs> okay. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Little nods from the back. <laughs> so um, we're definitely switching gears from that last panel, and I am by no means a policy person. I'm definitely a natural scientist. So what I'd sort of like to do today is to sort of introduce you to a tool that scientists can sort of provide to policy makers. And so really what I'm going to be talking about is using isotopes, so um, chemical isotopes of elements, to fingerprint metal contamination in the environment. So um, toxic metals are very important for health reasons and sort of transition us from the health panel that we just sat through to the natural resource panel. Um, so that's where I'm sort of going to be going today. Um, so just to sort of start off and step back to the basics, I wanted to talk about why metal isotopes are intriguing in the first place. So if you are not a chemist, um, an isotope is essentially any of two or more forms of an element that have the same number of protons in their nucleus but a different number of neutrons. So an element that most people can relate to is carbon. So two examples here are carbon-12 and carbon-14. And the only difference between carbon-12 and carbon-14 is that carbon-14 has two extra neutrons in its nucleus. And so what's really ideal about isotopes um, is that they have different chemical behavior even though they're the same element. And so they can perform differently um, as certain processes take place on the Earth. And so today what I'm going to do is focus on toxic metal isotopes and give you sort of two examples. The first is some research that I've done looking at uranium mining in California. And then the second example is work that was done in our lab here at the University of Washington, um, investigating some contamination from a lead smelter in Puget Sound. But the three main concepts that I want you to sort of walk away with this um, with are, first of all, that different chemical sources, be it a mine or be it a power plant or automobile traffic, have different isotopic fingerprints in nature. And so um, this graph is a little small, but what you're looking at here is lead isotopic space. Um, and you can see that three different contamination sources, leaded gasoline prior to 1980s, 1980s leaded gasoline, and then some mine sediments plot differently in this isotopic space. And then if you go to San Francisco and you dredge up some sediment from San Francisco Bay, you can see that what that sediment is is showing you a mixing between these three source contaminants. And so this is where isotopes really take you to the next level. You can go out to the environment and you can measure how much lead is there and you can tell whether or not there's an excess of lead and if you've contaminated it, but you can't necessarily tell where it comes from. And isotopes kind of give you that added step or that extra tool. Um, the second most important thing to walk away with is that natural isotopic variation um, that we see in the environment is quite often changed by anthropogenic sources. So we do have a human sort of imprint on what goes on in nature. And then finally, sort of stepping from that is that we now have the ability to measure really small scale changes in isotopes 
And by observing those small scale changes, we can say a lot about metal contamination. So the work that I'd like to talk to you about first is some work that I did looking at uranium contamination in transport. So uranium is a heavy metal. Um, in the environment, it exists in three main radioactive isotopes, uranium-238, uranium-235, and uranium-234. And the reason why we care about it is that uranium has been found to actually bind to human DNA and cause mutations. So prolonged exposure to even low levels of uranium can be highly carcinogenic. Um, most of the uranium that we know of in the United States was produced um, between the 1940s and 1980s, primarily for military and nuclear power purposes. And as an example, um, during this time, about 4 million tons of uranium was mined from just the Navajo Nation in northern Arizona. And as a result of all of this mining, approximately 30% of their water sources are contaminated above drinking levels. So this has made this sort of site one of the EPA's largest Superfund areas um, where we're trying to worry about metal contamination. So there's a lot of interest in where is uranium, how does it move, where is it stored both during and after transport. And so what I did was some work looking at a small abandoned uranium mine in California called the Juniper Uranium Mine. And it's located in Northern California, just east of San Francisco and north of Yosemite National Park. And what's really interesting about this mine is that there's a stream that runs directly from the mine onto recreational forest service land. And so as a scientist, that's really exciting for me because I can treat the mine as a point source to a natural stream environment. And then I can ask questions like, where does the uranium go? Is it transferred between the water and the sediment? Does it stay in the water? Um, does it chemically change as it moves downstream? And so just an example of where isotopes come into play, something that we know happens in the extreme environments is that if you have uranium-238 in the sediment, when it decays to uranium-234, it actually damages the structure of the sediment that's holding the uranium. And so by damaging it, it then makes U-234 more likely to be leached by water that's passing by because it's sitting in this damaged site. And so if we go out to a natural stream and we measure the 234 to 238 ratio, then typically we have a ratio that's higher than one. So that's something that we know that nature does. So then we can go to this site and say, do we see any isotopic evidence that changes what we expect to find in nature as a sort of a human fingerprint? So this is an aerial view of the juniper uranium mine. And you can see the open pit up here on the right. And then this is the Red Rock Creek that um, extends down onto the Forest Service land. And so up in its upper reaches, it has two branches, one that's separated from the mine by a small ridge and is essentially a clean creek environment for us. And then the other um, emanates directly from the mine itself. And then these two mix and continue downstream onto the recreational land. And this is a recreational Forest Service road for scale. Um, and then each of these little red points are areas along the creek where we went out and collected samples. So then um, I can also zoom out a little farther. And so this is the Stanislaus National Forest. And there's a ridge in the field area that also provides us with another clean creek, the salt creek, that drops off the other side of this ridge. And then we have the contaminated creek that I showed you in the slide previously where we collected samples. So we go out and we collect waters from the stream itself. We collect sediments, equidistant from the shore typically. And then we collect the mine tailings and the waste from the mine. And so this is the data that I'll be showing you today is these samples chemically processed. So waters will be in sort of blue colors. The sediments we take and we actually leach the outer surface of the sediment so we can tell what the metal looks like that is stuck onto the outer surface of the sediment. And then we look at the sediment itself after that leach as well. So there'll be sort of three sets of data. So this is isotopic space for uranium. And so what I have over here is the 234 to 238 isotopic ratio. So in a system that was in equilibrium, this would be a ratio of one, and it would fall along this black line. And so the first thing that you can see is that the natural creek samples, these are the clean creeks to the left, 
um, have this elevated 234, 238 ratio that I talked about was sort of what we expect to find in nature. Um, but when you move to the contaminated creek sites, then what you find is that this ratio has actually been lowered. So we can measure a difference chemically in contaminated sites versus clean sites in this sort of stream system. And if we look at the sediments, we see a similar effect. So the sediment data, um, the samples from the Clean Creek fall in equilibrium. However, when you move to the contaminated site, we again measure a change an anthropogenic change where you have higher ratios now that is similar to the higher ratio that's present in the mine tailings themselves. So we are sort of seeing this source fingerprinting in Red Rock Creek. And I'm just gonna zoom into the um, contaminated site area to look at the sediments in a little more detail. And so you can see that the first Clean Creek sample again is in equilibrium. And then you jump up to this elevated 234, 238 ratio. And what's interesting is that I've plotted these sample sites according to distance along the creek. So as you move farther and farther away from the mine source, you actually see this isotopic ratio decrease with distance. <clears throat> so you can see the influence of the mine decreasing as you move farther and farther away from the mine. So the other thing we can do aside from looking at isotopes is looking at concentrations. And so this is looking at the uranium concentration in the water that's in the creek. And so I've plotted the concentration of uranium on the y-axis here. And this is the Clean Creek samples. And so you can see that we measure no uranium in the Clean Creek waters. Um, when you move to the Red Rock Creek on the other side of the ridge in the field area, the um, branch of the creek that's separated from the mine also measures no uranium in the waters. But when we move to the area that comes directly from the mine itself, we have extremely elevated levels of uranium in the water, so much higher than what the EPA allows for standard drinking water. Um, the good news for recreation in the forest is that when these two branches meet and mix, you highly dilute the signal. And so the uranium drops below um, contamination levels. What's interesting for us, though, is that it never actually returns back to zero. So we didn't sample far enough into the forest to see the signal from the mine actually go away. Um, the final sort of piece of this project was then trying to understand where is the uranium? Is it staying in the water and we're just diluting it that much? Or is it actually being transferred to the sediment in the river? Um, and so this is the fraction of total uranium in the sediments. And so in the Clean Creek, you can see that most of the uranium, about 70% of it, is in the sediment itself, with a small amount of it being stuck on the outer surface of the sediment. But if you look at the contaminated creek, then we have the complete opposite. We're now 70 to 80% of the uranium is actually adsorbed onto the outside of the sediment. So what we're seeing is that absorption is a key element of uranium transfer along the creek. So the uranium is being moved from the mine to the outer surfaces of the sediment in the small creek. And that has important sort of implications because often you can change the chemistry of a creek a little through time and perhaps re-release that uranium from the sediments back to the environment. So even though you're not seeing it in the water downstream, you still have to be concerned about where these sediments are moving and how they're um, behaving with time. <clears throat> so just to sort of wrap up the results from this project before I step to the next one, um, there's sort of three little take homes. First is that the natural isotopic signature of Red Rock Creek is definitely <clears throat> measurably altered as a result of this uranium input from the mine. So we can see the mine source. And the second is, again, that this absorption plays a major role in the transfer of uranium from the mine sediments to the creek sediments. And then finally, good news is that the contamination levels of uranium are only above the EPA maximum concentration level for that site that is the closest proximity to the mine. And all other areas are pretty much safe. <clears throat> so this kind of gives you an idea of how we can use isotopes to study a system that's active today and something that's sort of continually evolving. But what's also interesting, especially to geologists, is what happens through time.
So often we're interested in how do these chemical sources vary as we go back into the past? And can you see chemical imp um, fingerprints and implications of contamination um, in non-present day environments? And so what I'd like to do is show you some data um, briefly from a study that was done in our lab trying to examine lead contamination sort of through time in the Puget Sound region as a result of the operation of the Tacoma smelter stack. So this is a smelter. Um, it's located right here, was located before they demolished it <laughs> here. Um, and it operated from the late 1800s to about 1986 and produced lead, copper, and arsenic in the smelter. And so as a result of that production, um, parts of Puget Sound are contaminated. And, it, and this is an EPA site, so they know about the contamination. Um, <clears throat> so what was done in this small study is that a core of sediment was taken from Quartermaster Harbor, so coring down into the sediment column in the harbor. And then the sediment in that core was then measured for lead isotopes. <clears throat> so that's the data that I'll show you now. And so this is a plot of lead isotopic space. Again, and you're looking at depth down into the core of sediment. So today, or present day, would be at the top of this core of sediment. And as you go down, you increase in age. And so if you look in the past at the um, data that's coming from the sediment, you can see some natural variation in the lead isotopic signal. Um, but definitely, you can sort of say, this is what Puget Sound looked like a long time ago. And then you notice that there's a drastic change here at about 30 centimeters depth, which corresponds to approximately 100 years ago. And what this is, is the chemical fingerprint of the operation or the beginning of the operation of this Tacoma smelter. And so this shift to a different isotopic value tells us that what the Tacoma smelter was producing is lead that is foreign to the Puget Sound region. So this is probably ore that was brought in from different areas via ship and train and then processed by the Tacoma smelter. But what's interesting is that we can definitely see this change. And even more interesting is if you leach these outer surfaces off and then look at the sediment again, the sediment itself still falls in the natural range of what we saw through time in Puget Sound. So again, what we're seeing is this contamination from the smelter being um, seen as contamination that's on the outer surfaces of sediments that still are around in Puget Sound. So that's sort of an interesting idea of looking at contamination through time. So just to conclude um, everything, it's a short talk to learn about metal isotopes. <laughs> but metal isotopes are this really interesting geochemical forensics tool that allow us to investigate multiple sources and the transport of these toxic metals in the environment. <clears throat> um, and if we can actually use them to fingerprint different sources, then this gives us a lot more information, not only um, regarding the processes that are taking place, but also perhaps the parties that are responsible for contamination in the environment. And so that can really help us aid um, in cleanup efforts of con metal contamination. Um, the th Third interesting thing is that isotopes can tell us how nature varies and then can also tell us how humans sort of change the natural cycles of the earth. So there, it's a really unique tool for that. And then I just sort of want to conclude by saying that as we continue to produce the earth, as we mine it, as we have power plants that operate, et cetera, this is only going to be a growing field. So um, there are many other metal isotopes that I didn't talk about today such as copper, zinc, and mercury that are really booming in the scientific community right now. And there are a lot of opportunities for undergraduate and graduate researchers, both here at UW in our lab and at multiple other labs in the area. So um, if anybody has any interest in this, I'd be happy to talk to you or students um, later today as well. So um, with that, I can conclude. Take questions if there are any. Adam. <laughs> Can you explain why, uh, why it's important if uh, the chemicals are on the outer layers or if they're inside the interior of the sediments? Like yeah. why, is that, why is that interesting? So it's interesting 
as, sorry, it's interesting because um, if, if you see a change, then you can see different sources too. So the, the sediment itself will always have a natural level of a certain metal. But if you have metal on the outside of a sediment, it becomes much more, the term is labile, but much more mobile in the future. So for instance, if you change the amount of oxygen that's in water, that can have a really big impact on how metal moves in water. So very small changes to you know, seasons, things like that, can actually take metal that's sitting on sediment and then move it downstream. So if you're a community that lives downstream of one of these mines, it's really important to know how much of that metal is actually accumulating that may become mobile someday and then end up in your water source. So just because it's stuck onto the sediment doesn't mean you can forget about it and not have to worry about it in the future. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so you've uh, found a correlation between um, the mining of, uh, of um, uranium mm -hmm. and the contamination in the stream. Mm -hmm. So on a policy level, would you like to see, I mean, how would we address that? Would, would you like to see a ban on mining or would, you, or would we want to treat the, the, the symptoms? Like, would, is, there, is it possible to treat the contamination? Yeah, it, it is possible to treat contamination, especially uranium contamination. They're coming up with all sorts of interesting things, including bacteria that can process uranium and use it. But, so you can just add bacteria to water. So people think of bacteria as a bad thing, but it can actually be a good thing. And, um, and it is important for, I guess, the continuation of mining to know that if you leave these open tailings out, that you're likely going to have a lot of transfer from, from the tailings to streams. And so people can start to think of ways to construct mines so that you don't have as much physical transport of material. And um, in this area of California, there's a lot of uranium mining, so there's multiple sources of uranium ore all over the Sierra Nevadas. And so unfortunately, a lot of these sites are abandoned sites, but, um, but in areas where you have ongoing um, contamination, you can see the different sources, and then you can also know who's responsible for more contamination and try to change the way that they produce the ore. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. It's just more of a curiosity thing um, from my standpoint. Because there's a fair number of um, uh, molecules of zinc and copper from the um, brake pads, linings from cars yeah. getting into the Puget Sound, do you see um, an application of this type of research for helping to measure whether um, different designs of brake pads might provide less material or in finding out other, other ways to address the questions of where you have the worst contamination? Yeah, definitely. So, um, so it's really interesting in, that you asked that. Um, we actually need more students to do zinc and copper isotopes in our lab, so if you know of anyone, <laughs> please send them our way. But, um, but you do have contamination from, yes, brake pads is a source of those contaminants, and then also this metal processing and, you know, from mining or smelting, they have a different chemical signal than brake pads do. So you could go into Puget Sound and look at sediments and try to identify you know, an automobile signal versus a mining signal and what you know, the magnitudes of those different signals are. And you could do a lot of different information and um, try to understand how the metals are moving. And there's a lot of stormwater research um, at our university and other universities where they're you know, trying to build bioswales and different things to remove these metals. Um, from stormwater runoff and try to prevent them from getting to large bodies of water where fish and things grow. But, um, but yes, it's definitely a really important field right now. Uh, thank you. Do we have to? <coughs> uh, last one. <laughs> uh, quick question. I was just wondering about the costs that are involved in this kind of testing in the sense of how practical it is to do widespread testing or it's very, you know, how long does it take and basically what, what kind of costs are involved? Yeah, so it is, the isotopic testing is expensive. Um, so it's much more than measuring a concentration is. Um, so ideally what you would want to do as a scientist is sort of set up a study where you can cut, get the maximum amount of coverage with a few isotopic 
data sets and then sort of apply it to a broader region where you have things like concentration data. So, um, so it's not as, at least right now, it's not as in hand as certain other simpler methods. Um, but we are getting better at it and sort of once you have a lab that has the capabilities to do these kinds of measurements, um, it, it becomes sort of a more routine process. So for example, our lab is very good at these high precision lead isotope measurements even though it's very difficult to make them, we sort of almost forgotten how hard it is to make them because we're, we're just getting better at it. So um, I think in the future it will only get better. Okay, thanks. <laughs>